All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Hussam Ghali. I am a master's student at Purdue University with the Belay Research Group. And today I'll be discussing my research and progress topic, which is the role of sugarcane bagasiash as a supplementary cementous material on the mitigation of the temperature crossover effect. So to begin, I will quickly, uh, as I was saying, I'm going to go on to objective, um, a quick background discussion. Like we know right now in the concrete industry, we have an issue in terms of our concrete production, more specifically cement, as it's a big contributor to our global carbon emissions at 8% globally. And currently, we have methods to decrease this carbon footprint, such as using supplementary cementous materials. And I'll just use that as SCMs, as you guys all know. And this is a good method to mitigate this decrease because it replaces cement as well as uses a, a waste product and gives it a purpose. And what the most common one that we use typically, as you guys all know, is coal fly ash. And this is a byproduct that we generate when we combust coal for energy. However, as we look out into the future for more green future as well as availability in terms of fly ash from coal, it's decreasing. So we do indeed need alternative solutions. And those include such as biomass ash, which can be an alternative SEM. And what biomass ash is, is an ash that is produced from the combustion of biomass waste for energy. And this biomass waste comes from the agriculture sector or the paper sector or the lumber sector. And we typically use wood, corn husk, and other agricultural products. But for this project, uh, we looked into sugarcane bagasse ash. And what that is, is from sugarcane waste what we use to make sugar, obviously. And we combust that, like I said, and we get an ash that's a pozzolanic material and has a siliceous composition. In terms of sugarcane, in general, it's a very abundant uh, waste that we have. And we have environmental benefits, such as I mentioned that we can lower the CO2 emissions generated from concrete by decreasing the amount of cement use, as well as giving this waste product that is currently being ended up and landfills and using it as a product. Also, it is a carbon neutral material. Also, it has economical benefits. Again, it can decrease the concrete cost by lowering the amount of cement. And it has the potential to have its own market because currently it is not used for anything if it's proven to be a useful SEM, obviously. So to go on for objectives that we did, we know that currently with biomass ash that we have a decrease in durability and it lowers the mechanical properties. So for this research, although we know some characteristics in terms of bagasse ash when we use it in symmetrous composites, we still have unknowns such as the curing temperature effect of ash. So for this research, we, looked, uh, we had an objective of understanding the role of high temperature curing on the sugarcane bagasse ash and its effect on mortar's strength, and more specifically, compressive strength. So for materials in this experimental campaign, we used mortar, and we had three different mix designs. We had a reference with no replacement, and we had 10% replacement of cement with ash, and then we had 20%. The ash was grounded and sieved to a 45 micrometer because when it's received, we wanted a more uniform and blender distribution. And then after casting and mixing them all, we had our curing conditions. So within each mix design, half of the specimens were cured at 21 degrees Celsius, and the other half were cured at 45 degrees Celsius to look at the different temperature curing effects. And they were cured for 28 days, and they all had a relative humidity environmental, uh, environmental relative humidity of 95% or greater. For methods to test our objectives, we did a particle size analysis for the sugarcane ash. And then we did x-ray fluorescence to look at the chemical composition. And then to test its compressive strength and its mechanical properties, we did compressive strength. Um, we also did x-ray diffraction to characterize the material better, as well as TGA and loss of ignition for better characterization. So with our results, I will discuss, I will begin about talking about particle size distribution. So for particle size distribution, we saw that the ash is a more coarser material when we're comparing it to ordinary Portland cement because we are replacing the cement with the ash. So that's why we compared the two. And then we looked at the chemical composition and as well as the loss of ignition. And in terms of chemical composition, what we did is we compared it with the ASTM standard C618. And in that standard, they have 
three the three listed classes N, F, and C as and their minimum requirements or maximum requirements in terms of the chemical compositions. And what we saw that in terms of class N and F, we met the requirements. However, in class C, we did not hit that with the calcium oxide. And then in terms of loss of ignition, we did not reach that at all. But in terms of class N and F, we can see that we are relatively close. Now looking onto the TGA results, what we did was we computed the total hydration products, and within the total hydration products, we computed the calcium hydroxi hydroxide content, or CH. And to be first discuss about the TGA, we'll talk about the total hydration products, or I will call it THP. And we saw that regardless of the replacement amount of ash, we saw that the THP is lower when we cure at higher temperatures. And then, however, when we look at a higher replacement levels when we use ash, we saw that the loss of the THP between 21 degrees and 45 degrees is mitigated, as you can see in the table with the differences. And then going on to the CH content, what we did was we took the ratio of the CH with the THP, and we saw that lower amounts of ash replacement results in a greater ratio, indicating more CH. Meaning, meaning more CH present, regardless of the curing temperature. However, when we do use the ash as a replacement, you see that ratio lowers when we're comparing the 45 degrees and the 21, indicating less CH present, indicating at higher temperatures that it is being consumed and indicating more pozzolanic activity. And going on to the compressive strength, we see that when we increase the amount of ash, um, we get a lower compressive strength just at 21 degrees Celsius by itself. Then when we look at 45 degrees, we can see that the ash increases the compressive, st compressive strength comparing it to the reference. So we can indicate that the use of ash mitigates the loss in compressive strength when we cure at 45 versus at 21 degrees. Now going on to the strength activity index, uh, we can see that the minimum requirement of 75% based on ASTM standard test, ASTM C311, that it's all met regardless of replacement level and curing temperature. However, you can see at 45 degrees Celsius, that strength activity index exceeds that 75% extraordinarily. And that we can also see that it's slightly higher for the ones at 10%. However, it's negligible, so we're not going to discuss that. And to conclude my results, my preliminary results, we can see that at high temperature curing, that the ash will increase the compressive strength. And looking at the crossover effect, the ash will mitigate the decrease of compressive strength that we see, as well as at higher temperatures when we cure, we see that ash has a greater posolonic activity. And lastly, at higher temperatures, we can see an increase in strength activity index. In terms of future work, since it is ongoing research, we want to investigate the influence of the ash's particle size and its performance as an SEM. And then we also want to examine our XRD results so we can get a better under understanding of the characterization of ash, as well as investigate different water to binder ratios on the ash's performance as an SEM. And then furthermore, we need to evaluate the ash's performance in concrete, because that's the more practical approach, and then do a life cycle analysis of SCBA in terms of sustainability and feasibility. Here are my references quickly, and I would like to thank everyone, ACI, Purdue University, and my colleagues for helping me.